They love the darkness. <laughs> good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you this day. Uh, blessed day. Having a few technical difficulties, as you know, this morning. So we'll press on, which is what we do. And I appreciate the work of the guys working on our, our electrics. And I hope that you do too. And so, uh, I want you to think a little bit. We're going to talk about the Prowler, as you see in your bulletin. Uh, we are going to be reminded of a tragedy that occurred on our own doorsteps, our own being the doorsteps in the United States of America. September 11th, tomorrow, will be remembered all over the United States. Ceremonies from the White House, Pentagon, <coughs> the New York area, Shanksville, uh, lots of... Uh, Memorials, we call that. Okay? Dedications, memories. With that, I want us to, and I'm glad that we're able to remind ourselves of that. I wish we didn't have to, obviously, as most of us do. But it is good to be reminded, reminded of what we have. Because imagine yourself 22 years ago, sitting in church, if you will, uh, on Sunday. Uh, hearing a message, perhaps, being encouraged, perhaps, uh, Lord willing, hearing the Word of God, maybe even coming to faith in Christ. But you anticipate when you go out the door that tomorrow, perhaps you'll be going to work. Uh, you just happen to work in the World Trade Center. Uh, you don't know that that morning at 832, your world will come to an end. Or it will certainly be challenged at the the very most, uh, 2,977 people were murdered by Muslims that day. A bell at each of these ceremonies is going to be rang for each of the uh, individuals who were lost uh, at the World Trade Center and the other places. It breaks down to about 2,606 people in the Twin Towers. Uh, we'll call them civilians. But then there were a bunch of first responders, 343 fire department, 23 New York police officers, and 37 port authority officers. 120 people in the Pentagon uh, and 40 at Shanksville, uh, Pennsylvania. 9-11 Heroes Medal was formed and developed. It was called the Heroes Medal of Valor. It was created to honor the 442 public service officers who were killed in the line of duty during the terrorist attacks. Medals are presented by George W. Bush to the families of fallen officers at the White House on September 9, 2005. Uh, when your life is in danger, it's hard to think about anything else. Uh, but most people, especially today, as time goes on, they don't think their life is in danger. They don't think they're in peril of any kind. I rather loved, as you've heard me express before, and when I was teaching at the Arctic School in Fairbanks, Alaska, we had what's called a newcomer's briefing every week. And every week, it was a slide presentation, and every week, pilgrims would come to the briefing <coughs> who were new to uh, the base uh, and to especially to the Arctic. Because um, it was just like the military had this odd thing about you want to go to the south and you love Florida and Miami and Arizona and they sent you to Alaska. It was, it was like some cruel punishment. Well, people had only heard about Alaska on the news, uh, that kind of thing, and Alaska is Amazing, glorious state. Loved it to death. But it's also a very harsh and bitter place. Uh, and people were totally out of their element when they would come there. There were people who were afraid that if you got off of pavement, because some of them had spent their whole lives on pavement, but if you got off of there, you were going to be eaten by a bear. In fact, we had a great picture of a big old bear just standing there looking, and we'd show him, okay, hey, what do you think of this? And boy, there it is. And we would tell them, yeah, they're all over the place. They're everywhere. <laughs> they're hungry. <laughs> and they would just get like fear and dread. Okay? And then we would say, but this isn't the, the 
uh, creature to fear, and then we would show, as he talked last week, we'd show him a picture of a mosquito. This is the creature to fear. Okay? Uh, but people never believed that they were in danger or peril. And my opening comment was always the same, pretty much, over the years. Uh, welcome to Alaska, the only state in the Union where you're considered a food source. <laughs> and I, I said that to encourage them. <laughs> because that's what they thought. You know, we've become lulled into a sense of, actually, apathy. And we are to remember that this day where bad guys, and they truly were evil people, uh, murdered us. They murdered us because you were Americans. Not because you were any specific group like a military or a police or anything like that. No, they just hate Americans. They call Americans crusaders. And uh, it's like they hold a grudge from the 1600s. They look at all Americans as bad guys. And so the enemy plotted and planned for months how to best harm the people of the United States. Up until that day, now again, that's because people forgot December 7th, right? And so they started to feel pretty secure. Yeah, it's just the, the regular mundane activities, go up, go to work, get home, etc. No thought about danger, or certainly injury, or certainly death. That's just not a factor. Uh, did the people feel secure? And so the question today goes out, do you feel secure? Secure. And I know today it's, it's very difficult to feel secure in uh, the areas that we come to. I want to read you a little excerpt, if you don't mind, from Voice of the Martyrs this last month. It's the, the article's entitled, The Church, Ready to Die. And I thought, well, now there's an intriguing headline. So, I read. Pastor John was standing behind the pulpit in his small church in the Middle East on Sunday morning, December 2nd, 2012, when about 20 heavily armed Al-Qaeda fighters stormed through the front door screaming jihad. The Islamists began pulling the nearly 40 terrified worshipers from their seats, beating them, shoving them to one side of the building. Then the group's leader ordered his men to aim their automatic rifles toward the congregation. He shoved his handgun against a church member's head and threatened to start shooting everyone in the church, one at a time. Some of the church members cried out in terror. Young girls standing near the pastor's wife grabbed her legs in such desperation that they tore her clothes. John said he was about to run toward the congregation when amid the chaos, God gave him a vision of heaven. I saw heaven open and I heard angels singing. He said, compelled by the heavenly vision, he yelled, God is welcoming us. Be at peace. We are going to heaven. His unexpected response to an imminent threat of death caused a reverent hush to file, fall over the congregation. All the people started, stopped crying, and ready to meet the Savior. John explained, they could feel the presence of God. If you read the Bible, when Stephen is dying, he's not crying, though the stones are painful. He saw heaven open, that was happening to us. Sensing the change in atmosphere, the Islamists seemed unsettled by this group of Christians who no longer feared death. This land belongs to Muslims, the Al-Qaeda leader yelled almost defensively. He and the other militants then started ransacking the church, taking the sound system, tables, chairs, generators, cell phones, minibus, and even some Bibles. Before leaving, the extremists vandalized what remained of the church and warned the congregation that they would kill them if they ever returned to the church building. But the next day, even more church members arrived to worship God. Amen. All King John said, around 50 people ready to die. The Al-Qaeda fighters never returned. And I thought, and there's much more to the, the article. 
What an amazing vision God gives people who are terrified. Terrified about dying. And I thought to myself, are you terrified of dying? Don't raise your hand if you are. <laughs> I have told you many times, I do not fear death at all. Not even a speck. Because I know death is to fall asleep here to wake up there. Right? To wake up in glory. Now, if you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, there's a good chance you should fear death. Because from that then comes judgment. We pause to remember a day of tragedy in our country. It is easy to be overwhelmed by the difficulties that we face every day. Every single day. We face difficulties. Individual, socially, family-wise, nationally, uh, state-wise. We face difficulties all the time. Uh, and some of them are awful unpleasant. Awful unpleasant. But by God's grace, we are to be, and we'll talk in a minute, to be aware. Now, there's very little as far as the social structure of our nation that inspires confidence in our nation's ability to recover from tragedy. Not like we did then, because we did respond. In the Bible, the past reminds us of shortfalls and where we need to be diligent. Our text today comes from 1 Peter in the New Testament, chapter 5, verse 6 is where we begin. 1 Peter. I wondered if Peter feared death. And the answer is, yes, he did initially. Remember, he fled from the presence of the Lord after his denials. But then he became emboldened in Acts chapter 2. And he became filled with the Holy Spirit, and he was the first one, as always, most of the time, Peter speaks up. And he's the first one in Acts to present a message on the gospel of Jesus Christ to the people who killed Jesus, as far as culture is concerned. And then when Peter writes his works, 1 Peter chapter 5, he talks about many things, practical Christian living. He's talking about serving God and how you serve God. And he's exhorting the leaders of the church, he's exhorting the members of the church on how they should live for God. But that they should be aware of something. Verse 6, Humble yourselves therefore into the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at a proper time. Casting, look at verse 7, All your anxiety upon him because he cares for you. And so right off, we see humble yourself. Uh, th that actually means to make low or to worship, to bow down. That's the idea of humble, hum uh, to lean toward God, bow down before God, under the mighty hand of God. There's nothing more powerful in all of the universe than the hand of God. Nothing. And so he is my God. I'm his child. <coughs> Excuse me. How do I know I'm his child? Because he tells me. I'm a child of God. A child of the king. And so he may, at the proper time, he will exalt me. Lift me up. Because I've cast all my anxiety upon him. That is a difficult thing to do. It's not a one thing, one time. It is a continual Throw your anxiety, put your anxiety, your worries, your cares before God. I like to say that we just bring it and set it at the altar of God. We set it at the foot of the cross. That's where we put our anxieties. Because I know there are some people who live in a fear of anxiety. Okay? They're afraid of being afraid. It's, it's strange. And some people have a fearful spirit. They fear all kinds of things. Now, it's not wrong to be aware, because he's going to say in verse 8, look, be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to, be, to devour. We are to be vigilant, watchful. We must see further. We must see through. 
And sometimes it seems so obvious we must look past that. We need to look something over carefully. Be alert. Most people today are extremely soft targets. Okay? Soft targets. Especially Christians, because Christians think everybody is honest and has integrity and, and that kind of thing. And that's not true. There's lots of people who are pathological liars and who intend harm, or at least the, their best self-interest. And so I, constantly you're, you're reminded in even small communities where people say, well, they never lock their doors. I've got news for you. Lock your doors. Well, that's not very trusting, Pastor. No, that's being alert. Being alert is to make yourself a harder target. Hardened targets, it's kind of like if you've ever gone out to the base or by the base when there's an imminent threat, you can't get in there. It is so secure, you just can't get in there. And if things happen while you're in there, you can't get out of there. Because they have all kinds of security to ensure that they become hardened to threats. And it doesn't mean you have a hard heart or a hard... No, you're just aware that threats exist. And even in the church, many people are not aware that the devil is a prowler. That he travels about. Now prowl means to tread upon or to walk all over. I rather like to think of it as the enemy wants to walk all over you, to tread upon you. And he's got millions of demons to assist in that maneuver. How protected, how vigilant, how aware are you as a Christ follower? These people in the church, they're in the Middle East. Bad guys break through the door. Are you aware bad guys could break through the door? <coughs> They do all the time. All the time. And we're going to read a passage here after a bit that means that they could even be in your midst. And so we look at that, and it is to be vigilant, to be aware. If you were fishing on a stream in Alaska and the salmon were running, I guarantee you, you were vigilant. You're looking up and down that bank all the time, for a bear to come out to have his dinner. And if you were blessed, you'd get to see one once in a while. And I always enjoyed that. And you would see people, they all got big guns in their holsters and all that kind of stuff. And I always kind of marveled. You'd meet them on the trail, they're coming back from fishing, and they got a couple of salmon, and they got them slung over their shoulder. I said, hey, bear bait. <laughs> Bear don't know when the salmon stops and you start. <laughs> that kind of deal. And they're doing what just comes naturally. Okay? Eating stuff. Smacking stuff around. Most of them that I've ever encountered aren't real fuzzy and cuddly and that kind of thing. Uh, most of them have an attitude problem. <laughs> Especially if they have their children and you're in the midst of their children. Oh man, I was charged twice by grizzlies in Alaska. Both times, it was because of cubs. Uh, amazing, amazing uh, to see a grizzly bear come right up close to you and pound their feet on the ground, throw themselves up in the air, roar at you and say, you know, I'm gonna eat you for dinner because you're messing with my kids. That gets your attention. <laughs> And one time, that's exactly what happened. I look at Dad and goes, look at that bear. And it was a grizzly bear standing up and over the altars, but a long ways away, two or three hundred yards. And, but there's a couple cups we couldn't see. And I said, we're on this side of the river, and the river's pretty severe, but it's only about 10 or 15 foot across, but it's deep and, and uh, flowing really severely. Uh, so loud, you couldn't hardly talk. Me and Dad are on this side of the river, the bear's on that side of the river. Okay? However, a friend of ours who's also in the group, he's on that side of the river. I said, oh, I've got to go tell him. 
I, because I'm so concentrated, I turn to go tell it, and I fall into a ravine. It's only a step about that dip, but I didn't notice it. Fell right flat on my face. Now, it stunned me for a second. I scrambled up, got over there, and he's over there laying on it. He's got his pack on the ground. He's laying on his pack like that, just resting. And so I'm hollering, yo, yeah. He finally hears me and gets my attention, but he can't hear what I'm saying. So he thinks, hey, something's up ahead. So he gets his rifle and he's coming up the shore. No, 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 get across the river, that kind of thing. So he's walking up the shore and I'm standing there. And I look and just from here to the church doors, today, just right there, here's those two cubs standing there. And I thought, that's interesting. And right between those two cubs comes Mama Bear. And she does exactly what I just said. And she's about from here to Mo, to me. Throws herself up in the air, growls at me, snaps her teeth, and then she turns around and she kind of ushers those cubs back into the alder bushes. Well, when she tur now she turns back toward me again, and I'm going, oh no. And so there's a little, it's kind of a steep bank where the river's cut it out, and she's in the middle. She comes out, I just pull down in front of her face with my rifle, boom, and I shoot into that mud bank. And that splatters rocks and mud all over her face, and she leads. Joe's walking up the bank when that happens. And here comes this bear right in front of him, saying that just a few steps from him. And so he had his pack, so he cuts his pack free. It hooks on a pistol he had on his belt. It jerks him to the ground. When it jerked him to the ground, he hears boom, and he hears the smack of that in the mud flat, and he thinks, I've shot this thing. So he's rolling around on the ground like an infantry treatment. <laughs> thinking it's going to protect, but by the time he gets up, it's gone. And of course, we're both just kind of panicking a little bit. And of course, then I see her, because I'm higher than him, I see her and the cubs moving off. Oh, thank you, Lord. Okay. Uh, but you see, even then, we weren't very diligent. We weren't very alert. Uh, and so once in a while, Good to be reminded that, you know what, there's bad guys outside. There truly are. The adversary is out there to tread all over the earth and on the lives of mankind. He's the adversary of you. Not a common adversary like a human, but an enemy that accuses you. He stands against you. He aims at your very soul. And we talked about that this morning in uh, Zeke's study. Where was Zeke's at? Oh, there he is. Uh, in Mark 5, about the demon-possessed man. He is not only the accuser of the brethren, you know the title, the accuser, it actually signifies or means a strike through or a stabbing. That's what the enemy does. He tries to strike through your soul, stab your soul. He's compared to a roaring lion, hungry, fierce, strong, cruel, fierce and greedy, and he's pursuing your soul. And he does so all the time. All the time. As he stomps about, he's looking for someone to devour. His whole, his whole design, Satan's design, is to devour souls. He won't stop. He is, un, he is relentless. He is unwearied. Doesn't get tired. He's restless. He's malicious. And he's night and day, day and night, studying, contriving how he can ensnare you and the world around us. And the world's not even aware that he's there. They're not even aware of it. And that's a sad testimony. They were aware of it on 9-11. Now they might just thought, well, that's just a bunch of Muslim murderers. Uh-huh. Influenced by Satan. Maybe even possessed by Satan. But certainly influenced by him. Look at 1 Peter 5, 9. But, since the enemy's out there prowling, the prowler, resist him. Firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. Our brethren around the world, as I just read out of Voice of the Martyrs, suffer. They suffer physically, that's true. They can't even suffer spiritually, that's true. But we resist him in the faith that if they can do it, I can do it. 
If this pastor can stand up and have a vision, then we can too. And we can see what God is doing. And Peter says in verse 10, after you have suffered for a little while, uh, Peter, no, no, change that so that we don't suffer at all. Because people today, especially in the church, they don't want to hear about suffering, especially the sufferings of Christ. That's the reason the prosperity gospel, the happy, healthy, wealthy, uh, word of faith uh, preachers, all, just all over television and that kind of thing, that's why they're so terribly dangerous. They don't even preach suffering ever. They preach, you're good, you're fine, you're wonderful, you're marvelous, God loves you, he has a great plan for your life. All which is true in him. But he also allows suffering, as we'll see in a second. After you suffered a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be dominion forever and ever. The fact is, the prowler attacks anyone who serves Christ. Brethren around the world are suffering that. We suffered it here on a huge magnitude on 9-11. All the great persecutions that have been brought forth are from the enemy, from the adversary, from the prowler. But God has given us four things here. The God of all grace. It says, who called you... Will. Now this means you, it could be you personally, or it could be you like Texas, y'all. Okay? But that's the deal. He's called you. And so what does he do? He will, number one, perfect. He will make your spiritual life complete. Lacking nothing is what that word means. Perfect. Lacking nothing. There's no lack in the Christ follower's life. Now, if you experience lack, you need to have some work to do. Secondly, he confirms. It means he sets, he establishes, he makes firm. What? He makes firm his word to us. He established his word centuries ago. He's brought it forth from an eternity past to an eternity future. His word will not go unaccomplished. It will accomplish what it was set forth to do. He will make you third stronger. He will strengthen you. And obviously, through James and Peter's teachings, we see that he makes you stronger through difficulties, through trials, through temptations. And then fourthly, he will establish. That means he will, it's almost like he will set your feet in concrete. He will firmly establish you, firm foundation, firmly planted, established, set. And so God will bring about in us a completeness which lacks nothing. He will establish our faith to us a firm faith. He will make us stronger through that faith, and he will set us on the foundation of Christ the Apostles and his word. It is not by strength or might of arms that we survive, which is what a lot of false cultures think. We survive because we've got a great military and a great army. We do. We've got, I think, the best in the world. And I've met lots of them, and so have you, and some of you were that one, some of them. I'd like you to go, just for a second, to Job chapter 1. Because sometimes the idea is, yeah, I'm good, I'm perfect, I'm confirmed, I'm strengthened, I'm established, I'm, I'm uh, righteous, I pray all the time, okay, God has blessed me mightily, and that was Job. A righteous man. And in Job chapter 1, verse 6, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord in verse 7 said to Satan, Where did you come from? Satan answered the Lord and said, From roaming about on the earth and walking around on it. And if I might paraphrase for a second, Where have you come from, Satan? Prowling. I've been prowling the earth. And this same phrase is used in Job chapter 2. The enemy of God, yes, thus the enemy of God's people, roams about, about the earth. He walks up and down the earth, looking, waiting, planning, destroying. 
The vision and goal is to destroy. Luke chapter 22. Listen to the word, 31. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath demanded permission to sift you like wheat. If I might pause there for just a moment. Jesus in Luke 22, 31 is talking to Peter. And he's telling him. Now Peter, I'm sure, is standing with the, the boys. Right? Uh, and it would be kind of like saying, all of you who Satan has demanded to crush to the earth, step forward. Peter, step forward. Okay? Uh, no one's going to volunteer for this duty. They're not going to step up. In fact, if anything, they're going to shrink back. Because you see, they don't have the empowering of the Holy Spirit in their lives at this point. Satan has demanded permission. You know, to attack you as a Christ follower, Satan has to get permission from God. Demons have to get permission from God to attack you. That's what happened in Job. Because God says, go ahead. When the Job, or, uh, Satan says about Job, I can't get to him. You got him protected. Okay? He's in your hand. Only you can't kill him. There's limits. But there's a permission that's granted. Lord, please don't grant Satan permission to do anything in my life. Ever. Or our city's life, or my family's life, or my country's life. Never. Our nation, in my humble opinion, the principle, is sifted like wheat on 9-11. Same thing occurred on December 7th, Pearl Harbor. Look at verse 32 if you're in Luke 22. I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail, and you, when once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Satan demanded permission to sift you, Peter, crush you. It's kind of like you take grain and you ram it between your uh, fingers and sift it. That kind of thing. Pressure, heat, all of that. And the answer apparently is yes. Go ahead. Sift them like wheat. I think, Lord, no, please, don't give them permission. God allowed bad guys to come into our country and to destroy 3,000 lives. God allowed that. And it certainly showed us, I hope it showed you, where did you stand? Well, once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Did you gather spiritual strength from 9-11? From the prowler who's attacking. I love the commercial. It said terrorists wanted to have a great impact on 9-11. Uh, and it showed a, a picture of a city street. Okay, just kind of a regular old city street. They wanted to change America. And then the next picture, and they did. It shows the same street, but there's American flags on every single house. It's the coolest commercial I've ever seen. And I thought, yes, we have learned from that. Now, the problem is we've forgotten that. We have forgotten. And we have thousands, and I'm not exaggerating, thousands of bad guys coming across our board. Thousands. And some of that, we know who they are. Why would you invent, or invite the Canaanite to come to your peace. Why would you invite the Philistine to come to your house? See, the idea is they would never do that. Peter, being all brave, says, yeah, Lord, Lord, with you I am ready to go both to prison and to death. Has a good attitude. He said, I say to you, Peter, the cock will not grow today until you have denied three times that you know me. You know, before daylight, before breakfast, you're going to deny me three times. Satan demands to permission to crush the apostle Peter. Satan is granted permission to crush the apostle Peter. Three denials of the faith, that's the sifting. That's the crushing of Peter. And we see he is crushed spiritual. He goes away weeping bitterly. Bitterly. He is sorrowed down to his soul. 
about his denials for Christ. But he's given the victory after the infilling of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. And then he's even asked by Jesus, do you love me? And some would say those three do you love me questions from Christ to Peter are affirmations of the three denials. Okay, I don't have any problem with that. Some are not aware that there is an open hostility, hostility toward the church today, towards God and toward his people. And sometimes it's surprising how close it is. Ephesians 2 says this, You are dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Paul tells the Ephesian church, there is a spirit of the air, the power of the air, the spirit of the earth, and that spirit is a demonic spirit. It's called Satan and his demons. They have power, they've been given a certain amount of dominion over the earth today, and they take it very well. The enemy of God is working through people to accomplish his plan. That plan can and does include an attack on every Christ follower of God and all churches, true churches of God. Now, false church, Satan don't mess with. Because they're already false and lost, and so he don't have any reason to uh, be with them. He deceives them. That's true. They fall into that deception. And what a wonder it is when Danny and Bonnie were here to hear about people in Iraq and Muslim people who come to faith in Christ Jesus from different arenas, different regions, but they step out of the darkness into the light. What a glory that is. What a glory. You don't have to tell them how dangerous it is. Those people that are living in those camps over there in Iraq, you don't have to tell them how dangerous it is. Okay? They already know. Many of them have already lost members of their family because of the danger of coming to Christ in a government or a, a tribe or a bandit group, okay, criminal group, kill them, hurt them, destroy them, force them out. Some have been forced out by their own families, cast out into the street because of their faith in Christ. Turn to Jude, if you would. Easy to find. It's almost out of the Bible. Clear back to the right. We're going to go through a little bit of the book of Jude. In fact, it will be lots of it. Okay. Jude, this is the half-brother of Jesus, right? This is one of those brothers who were not totally believing in him, who actually thought he, Christ Jesus, was out of his mom. But Jude, full of the Holy Spirit, writes scripture. And in Jude, chapter, not chapter verse 3, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Jude says, you know, I would like to preach like all these guys that talk about the joy and the greatness that we have in Christ. The abundant life that we have, the blessings of God that we have, the favor of God that we have as Christ followers. I'd really like to talk to you about all of those things. And isn't it isn't it a glory, isn't it a wonder that you can sit with someone and talk with them about what God's doing in your life? What a great blessing it is. And we get some of that here. In our study groups, we get quite a bit more. If you're not involved in the study groups, this is my unsolicited plug for study groups, okay? But you get involved with one, or two, or three. We have lots of them, right? Because your faith will grow. But you will get to hear testimonies of other brothers and sisters in the faith and what God's doing in their lives. And that is just, to me, a, such a blessing. That's what Jude wants to do. But he says, I can't do that. I'm going to appeal to you, earnestly appeal to you, to contend, to strive for the faith, the true faith. Why? Why? Why am I going to talk about you having the necessity of having an unaltered faith? Because of verse 4. Certain persons have crept in, and I put, under crept, I put silently slithered. 
Because that's kind of what that word means. It means secretly. Certain persons have crept silently slithered in unnoticed. Those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Long beforehand, the prowlers were identified. They're identified. Those are the people that are after their own self, their own way, their own way, way of doing business. You know, no offense, okay? I mean, no offense. But if you found yourself to be a church hopper, that kind of thing, church hoppers are unstable, okay? Uh, because they hop from church to church to church to church. And I always wonder, what are they looking for? What are you looking for? I've even asked some of them, why? Well, because in lots of times it's because of programs. Well, they have a good youth program or they have a good music program or whatever. And all of that is the wrong reason to be in church. It's an encouragement. But if your church is not teaching and proclaiming the word of God, cast it aside. Cast it aside. Find a church who preaches the Bible and Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel, his gospel, clearly. And I pray that's what we do. We even say it on our signs, so I'm reminded of it every week. Right? And it's true. Certain persons have crept in unnoticed. You wouldn't notice them. Now in the church today, the reason people don't notice other people is because they don't know other people. I mean, they know like I saw you, perhaps. I was in a service where the church had two services. Okay? Now I'm not throwing a stick on two services. Okay? But sort of am. <laughs> we may have to go to that ourselves as no. we grow. <laughs> So I'm in a group that's going into the church, and there's a group coming out of the church service, the, the worship center. As I'm doing that, the person in front of me, and there's a person coming this way, so, hey! And then, well, hey, what are you doing here? Well, I've been going here for like 10 years. Really? They know each other, they're friends, and they had never seen each other in church. They had no clue that they attended the same church. I was just blown away by that. You mean you guys are in the same church? I didn't say this. But you don't know each other? What a sad testimony that is to me. Okay, now that's just my view. I understand multiple services, not because you got thousands of people that want to hear the word of God. I understand that. But don't get stuck in one service. Go to several. Okay, you went to the, the 9 o'clock service on one Sunday. We'll go to the other 10 or 11 o'clock the next week. Meet the people of God and meet them. These people who have slithered in, verse 10, these men revile things which they do not understand, the things which they know by instinct like unreasoning animals. By these they are destroyed. The prowlers revile. They speak against. They say evil against the good things, the things of God, the things they don't understand. Do you understand the mercy of God? The grace of God, the command to love one another. Do you understand the salvation where you have been rescued, redeemed, purchased by the blood of the cross? These are difficult things for people to understand. And people mock them all the time. Especially the blood of the cross. How could one man die for all men? What's his blood got to do with him? They, they revile things they don't understand. And there's lots of those. They're like an unreasoning animal. They just file in, file out. I watched the thing where cows were going in to get milk. In a big, gigantic uh, dairy farm. Okay, The cows know it's time for milky. They show up. They don't have to go call the cows. They don't have to send a rider and a whip to get them there. They just show up. And they file in. And in this case, they were going on to this gigantic round thing. And so they knew, just step up, get on the round thing, okay? 
get milk, step off. Twice a day. They showed up twice a day. They didn't have to encourage them or anything else. I saw a, a person who was involved with uh, milking goats, big goat uh, population, to make cheese and such. And uh, they go to the gate, the goat, so let's all show up at the gate for milking. They open the gate, four goats. Now, again, whether they know it's just four, but four goats go in, they run across by the person, run up to the stand, jump into the stalls where they're supposed to get uh, milk. Now, they're jumping in those stalls because there's food there. <laughs> right? Same with the cows. They don't understand what they're doing. They're just by instinct doing that. They know, oh, show up at that door and you get food. We had a dog, actually he's still alive, he's at my grandson's. When he's hungry, he'd bring his dish to you. <laughs> oh, okay. Seemed like he was always carrying his dish around. <laughs> of course, he got to be like a walrus. <laughs> those people, those prowlers, Jude has a message for them. Verse 11, woe to them. They have gone the way of Cain, rushed headlong into the air of Balaam, perished in the rebellion of Korah. Cain, Balaam, Korah, they all have things in common. Different events, different people groups. You can read about them in the Old Testament. He says, these people, these prowlers, are hidden reefs in your love feast. They feast with you without fear, caring for themselves. Excuse me. They are clouds without water, carried along by winds, autumn trees without fruit. Doubly dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea casting up their own shame like foam, wandering stars for whom the dark, black, black darkness has been reserved forever. These people are identified. The prowlers are identified. What identifies them here? Caring for themselves and producing nothing useful for anybody else. They're easy to see. They come to all the potlucks. As they come, they're there for themselves, not fellowship with you. That's what prowlers do. Then they kind of poke a little bit. And what they do is they poke because of the word of God. They're grumblers. They find fault. They're following their own lusts. They speak arrogantly. They flatter people for the sake of gaining an advantage. They're grumblers, complainers. You didn't like that message, did you? Well, wasn't that an awful message today? I don't even know what to do. Stand the faces and give up such a pitiful message. Okay? Don't you agree, right? Uh huh. Man, that potluck was terrible. <laughs> Anybody who's been to our potluck says, What are you talking about? Okay? Yeah, I don't like the way they, they bring those verses about certain sins. Yeah, they, they shouldn't do that. You know what? You shouldn't be too political up here. You shouldn't be too political in the church. You know, that's kind of because we have a separation of church and state, they say. Okay? They're talking about something they do not understand. The people of God in the church are the people of God in the community. They're the people of God that go to our uh, public outfits, schools, wherever. There are people of God who serve in all of the first responder things. They actually end up being the people who vote. <clears throat> Don't you want them to be intelligent about all of that? <clears throat> how to respond in the work center? How to respond politically? I think we should. Obviously our job, my job, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay, Preach the word. That's what my job is. Preach the word. The second part of my job is to equip the saints for works of service. When you leave here, you're better equipped to do whatever you need to do out there. I want to close with the end of this, verse 20. But you, beloved, you, beloved, there are six things you need to do. Okay? If you were wondering, what should I be doing about this? How should I guard myself? Well, the fact is, you let God guard you. Yes, you don't make yourself a soft target, but you understand there's bears out there. There's lions out there. There's wolves out there. You should be aware of that. You, beloved, number one, building yourselves up in the most holy faith. Build your faith. Build. Doesn't mean physically. 
It means spiritually build your faith. Add a board, add a nail, add a sink, add a shelf, add beauty to your spiritual faith. Build your faith. You do that, by the way, through fellowship, through study, through uh, church attendance. That's how we build. Secondly, praying in the Holy Spirit. You are to be a man and a woman of prayer. And all prayer is talking to God. The Spirit will sort out your prayers. Jesus himself intercedes as the Spirit does to tell God what it is you're trying to say. Because sometimes my prayer is not what God wants. And so I want the Holy Spirit to sort this out. Sort this out. So I pray. And number three, verse 21. Keep yourself in the love of God. Keep yourself in the love of God. Does that mean, oh, I just stand there, God pours his love out on me? No. I keep myself. I secure myself in the love. I guard myself in the love of God. And the love of God extends through Christ, through us, through the disciples, to us today, how you extend love to others. And it is the agape love, not the other types of love. It is the agape, self-sacrificing, other-centered love. Keep yourself in the love of God. Fourth, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. Wait. Wait on the Lord. Be patient. Some of us want to force the doors open, when in fact what you need to do is be patient, wait for the door to open. Okay? Now most in the church, and I have to be cautious about this, they say, I'm just waiting for the Lord. And they do nothing. Waiting on the Lord is not an excuse. It's what we do. We wait for His mercy. And because of that, verse 22, number 5, we have mercy on some who are down. Do you have mercy on those in your family and in your work center and in your daily lives that are doubters? They doubt the Bible. They doubt salvation. They doubt Jesus. They doubt all kinds of stuff. Do you have mercy on some of them? Right? You don't say, oh, good, you're going to burn in hell forever. Goodbye. I don't want to ever talk to you again. Is that merciful? Is that gracious? It might be true. But I'm to have mercy on some who are doubting. And sixth and finally, verse 23, save others. Save others, snatching them out of the fire. And on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. Okay? And which is number seven. Save others, snatching them out of the fire. I've seen fire scenes, and I know you have too, where people take and hold a child out of a window and drop the child down to first responders. Snatching them out of the fire. We've seen first responders. While people were going down the towers, people were going up the towers. And those people were first responders, many of which were killed going to snatch others out of the fire, out of the problem. And then to have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. I will have mercy, and I'm going to combine that with fear. Just because I don't say something doesn't mean I don't approve of the something, or do approve of the something. Okay? People say, well, you didn't say anything, so we thought you approved of it. Okay, maybe I should have said something then. Because I don't approve of this. And that's what the Christ follower is. That's why these people are holding church service in these foreign areas. That's why bad guys, Al-Qaeda, who hate God, they hate Christians, they hate Christ. That's why they burn them down. They burn them down. That's why they burn down the Twin Towers. Because foolishly, they think, like an unreasoning animal, if you live in America, you're a Christ follower. Wouldn't that be great if it was true? I don't know how many people came to Christ after the two towers, but I know it's more than one. More than one. How many people rededicated their lives, came to Christ in a real way, through tragedy, through terrible tragedy? And so it's good for us to remember that. We need to be reminded we're struggling in a war zone, but first and foremost, the battle belongs to the Lord. Amen.
several prayer